Hello everyone and welcome back to AMOS, our course on Agile methods and open source software. We are in part 5 on software development and have been focusing a bit already but now fully on programming practices. While the overall process of AMOS is structured by Scrum, we will now dive more deeply into complementary approaches, most notably extreme programming or more precisely engineering practices that either came out of extreme programming or somehow were associated with the community that created extreme programming. So in this second section of part five, I will talk about the general principles of uh, that extreme programming gave us as well as test driven development as an outgrowth of thinking about technical debt and how to refactor your code to a cleaner code base. XP has given us a couple of general principles that are good to know and good to apply. They're also very uh, poignant, so it's easy to keep them in mind. The a very basic one, even beyond uh, XP, beyond extreme programming, is the KISS principle, or keep it simple, which says keep it simple. And the idea here is that you are better off trying the most simple solution that could possibly work and do not prematurely make it more complex. This is also echoed by something that is now specifically extreme programming, at least I haven't heard it anywhere else, something called YAGNI, you ain't gonna need it, which is stating that not only should you keep simple, you should not be investing too much into the future. Now that needs an explanation. Uh, developers love to think about all the things that can go wrong because it's them who get hurt if there are bugs and people come complaining. Uh, nevertheless, um, planning for all eventualities, in particular if they will never happen, is a lot of waste of time and implied money. So do not plan out, that's what Yagni says, all the possible things that can happen but rather keep it simple to what you already know you need now. Do not assume you need these bells and whistles in the future if there's no product owner telling you, no, we need it now. So do not start implementing things which are uncertain in terms of whether anyone actually will ever need them just because you think they will be needed. Um, such premature implementation is likely to be wasteful. As you program, you should be dry. Don't repeat yourself. So good code is simple, straightforward, and is not particularly redundant. This principle will go hand in hand with refactoring, which we will see in a bit. And here's one principle which isn't specifically extreme programming, but which I like to add, which is that old adage on premature optimization and how it's hurtful. As you look at your work, as you look at a feature that needs implementation, you should think about it in these three stages. First, make it run so that you understand what it is about. So making it run means you are learning what it is that the user or customer really wants. Then in a second step, you make it right. So now you look at the implementation where from step one, it may have been a bit shoddy and not covered all the corner cases. And now you make it a nice consistent implementation that covers uh, what needs covering and is logically consistent and of high quality. And then only in a third step, do you think about making it fast, meaning changing the implementation one more time so that the performance is improved over the right, easily readable, understandable solution. So make it run to learn what this is about. Make it right so that you have crossed all T's and dotted all I's and make it fast if performance requirements instruct you to do so.
Extreme programming has given us an important metaphor that people like to use called technical debt. Look at this slum, shanty town, something that is, well, perhaps easy to get lost in. This is an illustration of uh, what has also been called a big ball of mud, a metaphor for architecture. Um, where there really is no recognizable architecture. That's why it's a big ball of mud. Um, some systems simply grow and grow and grow without ever getting fixed. So it's just one slab of mud on top of each other, forming a ball maybe, but no particular structure recognizable with the consequence being that over time you can only really incrementally add to it but not make any fundamental changes. So beware a change in reality or context that requires you to make substantial changes. You will not be able to do so with a big ball of mud. And um, that's which gave rise to the metaphor of uh, well-factored code on the one hand and technical debt to pay off on the other hand. So first, well-factored code. Code that would be the base for not a big ball of mud is well-factored code, which is maintainable. So you can read it, you can understand it, you know the implications, you know the consequences if you were to change a line of code. It's also, well-factored code is also extensible meaning as you add to it it's not only that you slab on something it's actually that you can uh, adapt and evolve it in such a way that it has uh, clear predictable consequences and that predictability applies not just to single lines of code but the overall architecture so because again you know the consequences and thereby you can plan any larger scale changes and arrive and go from one consistent state of the code base to another. If this is not the case with your code base and which code base is so nicely or perfectly factored that it's always well factored, then maybe you have something called technical debt. So I believe it was invented by Ward Cunningham. So let me illustrate or let me let Ward explain technical debt himself. I became interested in the way metaphors uh, influence how we think uh, after reading George Lakoff and Mark Johnson's uh, Metaphors We Live By. An important idea is that we reason uh, by analogy with the uh, uh, me metaphors that have entered our language. I coined the, the debt metaphor to explain the refactoring that we were doing uh, on the uh, Ycash product. This was a, a, an early uh, a product done in uh, Digitalk Smalltalk. And it was important to me that we uh, accumulate the, the learnings we did about the application over time by modifying the program to to look as if it had been uh, as if we had known what we were doing all along and it and to look as if it had been easy to do in small talk the explanation uh, i gave to my boss and this was financial software was a uh, financial analogy i called the debt metaphor and that said that if we failed to make our program align with what we then understood to be the proper way to think about uh, our financial objects then then we were going to continually stumble over that disagreement and uh, that would slow us down which is like paying interest on a loan uh, with with borrowed money you can do something sooner than you might otherwise but then until you pay back that money you'll uh, you'll be paying interest I, uh, I thought borrowing money was a good idea. I thought that rushing software out the door 
to get some experience with it was a good idea, but that of course you uh, you would eventually go back and as you learn things about that software, you would uh, repay that loan by, uh, by refactoring the program to to reflect your your experience as you acquired it. I think that there were plenty of cases where people would rush software out the door and uh, learn things but never never put that learning back into the program and and I and that, that by analogy was uh, uh, borrowing money thinking that you never had to pay it back. Of course if you do that you know say with your credit card eventually all your income goes to interest and your purchasing power goes to zero. By the same token if you develop a program for a long period of time by only adding features and never reorganizing it to reflect your understanding of those features, then eventually that program simply does not contain any understanding and all efforts to work on it to take longer and longer. Uh, in other words, the interest is total. Uh, you'll make zero progress. A lot of uh, bloggers, at least, have uh, explain the debt metaphor and uh, confused it, I think, with uh, the idea that you could write code poorly with the intention of doing a good job later and, and, and thinking that that was the primary source of debt. I'm, I'm never in a favor of writing code poorly, but I am in favor of writing code uh, to reflect your current understanding of a problem, even if that understanding is partial. You know, if you want to be able to go into debt that way by uh, developing software that you don't completely understand, uh, you're wise to make that software reflect your understanding as best you can so that when it does come time to refactor, it's clear what you were thinking when you wrote it and making it easier to refactor it into what your current thinking is now. In other words, the, the whole debt metaphor, or let's say the ability to pay back debt and make the debt metaphor work for your advantage depends upon you writing code that is clean enough to be able to refactor as you come to understand your problem. I think that's a, a good methodology. It's at the heart of extreme programming. Uh, the debt metaphor is an explanation, one of many explanations of why extreme programming works. All right, so this was Ward Cunningham on one of his many innovations or inventions, the metaphor of technical debt, where he is using financial domain language to explain software development to managers. So that's the strength of using a metaphor that speaks to managers who might otherwise find it hard to relate to engineering concepts. So the idea of technical debt is that uh, you can take up technical debt in the sense of incomplete implementations that don't cover everything yet because you're still learning, but that you will have to and thereby you pick up speed. But later on, you will have to fix your code and make it nice. So go from make it run to make it right because you learned and that's how you pay back your, uh, your, your debt. If you never refactor, meaning never turn your made it run code to made it right code, uh, then you're not paying back your debt. But the problem is exactly that, that with increasingly not so well factored code, you will find it harder and harder to change it. The interest is compounding and your code will deteriorate in quality until eventually uh, eventually you will not be able to change it any longer. So identifying technical debt is not always that easy. Nobody usually, nobody writes poor code deliberately. So you have to run into it over time, recognize it in the moment. And that has, that need has spawned a fair bit of work on so-called refactoring. So first of all, you need to identify that there is technical debt in front of you. It's easy to forget it. So this is, 
This has led us to code smells, code that smells badly somehow because there's technical debt present. As you have identified those smells, so well, maybe there's no need to act yet, but maybe there is. So you need to see whether the code smell is so severe that you should act on it and remove it. And that acting on it and removing on it and removing the technical debt is called refactoring of code. So let's take it in steps. Code smells, according to Martin Fowler, are structures in the code that just violate good design somehow. And it's, as a smell, it indicates probably a deeper problem. Uh, so once you look at it, you may have to dig deeper, but um, at least you have a starting point. Code smells are not bugs. The software may just work just fine, but um, it still stinks to smells to the eye of the uh, software developer, implying that in the future there are problems. And then the question becomes, when will you fix that problem? So example of code smells are lots of duplicated code. Yeah, the, the function may still work, but lots of redundant code means, well, if eventually say there's a bug in this code, then the bug will exist many times and you need to find all the occurrences of it. So better to not have duplicated, duplicated code. Long methods usually imply poor understanding of the domain with many ways out that fail. Large classes, same thing from on the level of uh, classes. So to address that, you need code refactoring. Code refactoring means changing your code to remove the smells, uh, to have better factored or even well factored code that can uh, live on, can be understood, will not give you problems in the future. Refactoring your code is paying back that debt you picked up to learn and get something out the door. By definition, a refactoring, a code refactoring is a behavior preserving transformation of existing source code. As just mentioned, a code smell does not indicate a bug. At present, the software may be working well. As a consequence also, a refactoring is not fixing a bug. A refactoring is changing existing code that works uh, into a better form uh, to make future evolution easier and more likely to be successful. So clearly that will upset some managers who will argue, why are you even touching well-working code? Never touch well-working code. Well, again, you want to touch well-working code because it smells from the engineering, not from the customer perspective, from the engineering perspective. And Engineering managers and software developers need to realize that they are one of the stakeholders of the software. The customer is a stakeholder, uh, they have expectations of the software, and so is the software developer who's making his home inside the code and wants it to be reason has a right to have it reasonably clean. Not perfect. There are costs associated with keeping code clean, but in some cases, when the smell is so bad, that cost of refactoring the code to remove the code smell is wholly justified. The term refactoring was coined by Bill Opdyke in 92 and popularized by Martin Fowler in 99 and later. A refactoring then is an instruction of how to turn a smell or how to remove a smell. So, for example, from a long method, extract methods that are repeatedly needed. And here um, you can see redundant code where there's an all photos dot put that hard codes in, in multiple places that hard codes are the data structure, the underlying data structure, the map in many places would be better perhaps if that was moved into its own method. So we extract a do add photo method which hides both uh, the access to the data structure as well as the data structure itself. 
The big question, of course, is a possible point of contention between an engineering manager and a software developer or a product owner and a software developer, in which case engineering manager or product owner would be overreaching, but they're humans, so uh, why would they not? Uh, they would try to tell you, do not refactor, just do new features. All that ever counts are new features. And so, of course, no. Um, again, software developers as stakeholders, they have a right to a reasonably clean house, uh, the code base they have to work with. So then, how, how do you determine when it's justified to refactor? We need uh, heuristics or rules where a software developer can push back that product owner, which tells them new features, new features, don't, don't refactor it. So here's one. Uh, here's the three strikes rule. When you see for the third time some smell, maybe it's time to refactor. So you're doing something, you're writing it, maybe not perfectly, you just do it. Uh, you're writing some other code and you realize it's really like that other code you, write, you previously wrote. So you recognize the duplication, but you don't jump to a refactoring right away. Only when you run into the third time you write code like the other two previous cases that you decide that maybe it's time to clean that up, extract a method from the redundant code, for example, as a possible refactoring, and thereby remove some technical debt that you accumulated and have a nicer code base. To the developer, this implies that you really have two hats, um, which indicate the state or the way of or the focus of your work at any given point of time. You are either adding new functionality in some form or another, or you are refactoring. You're never doing both together. Usually, one would think you are adding functionality, so you are in add function mode. But then something starts to smell. And if it becomes too strong, you switch over from adding functionality to refactoring it, to refactoring your code. So again, that refactoring is not going to add new functionality. It is changing the code structure without changing behavior. By definition, as explained, a refactoring is a behavior preserving transformation of code. So it does not touch what the customer or the user sees. It only touches what the software developer sees. So you're cleaning up. And once you finish that cleanup and the code, at least where you are, does not smell anymore, then you finish the refactoring and you move back to adding functionality. The code smells on the left match certain refactorings that solve the problem, that remove, that dissolve the smell. And so there are one to many mappings, usually one smell, multiple possible solutions in the form of refactorings. There's a whole book or multiple books out there by now, which give you or explain those refactorings as the problem solutions to code smells. And sometimes these refactorings get complex, meaning it's not just one refactoring to be applied, but it's a whole sequence of statements to be applied. So for example, a switch statement is usually not good, such great code. And you extract a method, you move it up a class, you replace uh, the switch itself with some, with some say, polymorphism-based uh, calls to uh, separate methods, uh, what have you. So there are different things, and they sometimes lead to a chain of small atomic refactorings. And the good thing, as you probably are aware, is that um, these refactorings as behavior trans uh, preserving transformations, these refactorings are made available as almost fully automated code changes that you can use a wizard or that you can use your IDE to carry them out. The simplest one, the most widely used refactoring is you guessed it, 
the renaming of methods or variables or classes. Probably 80 to 90% of all refactorings that developers use the IDE for, um, where they use the refactoring functionality of the IDE is to rename, rename uh, some, some logical object in the code. As you can see here in the menu, there are actually many, many other refactorings. Developers don't like to use complex refactorings, maybe, be, that's my impression at least, maybe because they don't fully understand it and or they rarely trust an IDE to maintain the code formatting that they like. So some people are just picky and something as large as extract a superclass, um, which might lead to code that you have to reformat by hand anyway, is often more likely to be done manually by a developer. That's why, uh, again, renaming is the by far most dominant refactoring used through an IDE, though in total, I imagine uh, renames are uh, less of, uh, are, are still the most important one, but don't, uh, don't occupy 80-90% of all uh, refactorings. They have a smaller percentage. It's just that renames are the ones, one form of refactoring that you do through the IDE. The rest you do manually. Another quiz for class and on to test-driven development. So, extreme programming gave us something called test-first programming. Kent Beck, which is one of the inventors of extreme programming, um, coined the term and it was a step or stepping stone to what later became test-driven development. So by now you should have had your quality assurance class as part of your software engineering lecture perhaps, so you should know that uh, testing is a process of quality assurance where you write tests and execute tests to gather feedback about the quality of the code base. These tests can be automated, so you write test code, they can be manual. Often unit tests are wholly automated while uh, functional tests, um, user interface tests are done manually. But even there you can automate it using uh, tools that follow your clicks and uh, match expected output with what is expected. Yeah, what is given. So uh, different types of tests. I don't want to repeat your, your other courses here. Uh, you focus on individual units, components, you can have acceptance tests, looking at the functionality, and you can have uh, integration tests and complex systems where you test that the different components work together uh, well. Now then, in test-driven software development, we develop tests. We develop not just one test, but rather multiple tests. Often these tests are grouped into classes, in particular for unit testing and JUnit, as you probably know it. These sets of tests are officially grouped in a test suite and they will be structured hierarchically. So you have test suites of test suites of test suites and thereby in a possibly large hierarchical structure of tests cover the whole system and provide a test suite for the whole system that starts with a single root test or a single root node under which you will find a hierarchy of test suites with the actual tests as the leaf nodes. All tests, all non-trivial tests need a setup. So we need a test setup which, um, which uh, initializes the system in such a way that meaningful tests can be run. That is often necessary. For example, you have substantial state to test again. So you need to set up a test database and what have you. The result of running a test is the test result. Usually you don't just stop running the tests because one test fails. Uh, usually you just run all the tests and accumulate the results and show the user a list of, if so, 
failing tests. The software uh, used to write and execute the tests is called a test harness or test framework. And the prime example in Java would be JUnit that you probably all are familiar with. So using these basic concepts of tests and testing, test first programming is a practice where developers think about what they want to do, but don't do it right away. Rather, they devise tests for it and they implement the tests first. And then, only then, do they implement the functionality that makes the tests work. So you start with the tests first and then you um, implement the functionality to make them run and then you add another test and then you add new functionality to make the new tests run and so forth. So you're basically developing your functionality only after you created appropriate tests for it. The benefit of this approach is that right off the bat, you get two perspectives on your functional code. One is the testing perspective and one is the main reason why you even do it in the first place as you integrate your functionality into the existing system. And these two perspectives already constitute a triangulation. Uh, it's a duangulation, a triangulation where two perspectives is more than one perspective and will already make it much more likely that you avoid bugs in the first place. Um, so writing tests first gives you an extra perspective that clarifies the functionality, the behavior, and thereby improves quality right, right away. Next to that the tests will catch bugs in themselves. Also, but that's test-driven development, so I'm jumping ahead a bit. If you have a lot of tests, they will catch, catch bugs more quickly and they will allow you to continue working with a, with a constant development speed. This leads to the, uh, this mantra, if you will, where you only write new functionality when you have a new test that fails. For, so you write the new code to make the test work, meaning the test uh, signals green, so red and green are JUnit terminology, failing code is marked red and succeeding, code, succeeding tests are marked green. So you only write new code when a test fails and once you have done that, you made it run, then you make it right. So next step is you eliminate waste. That matches nicely with, uh, with refactoring. So again, you write a new test, things fail, you get a red signal, then you make the tests succeed by writing functionality that solves the problem. So now you get a green test, but it may not be of the code quality that you need. It smells in some form or another. So you refactor it, you refactor it to remove the code smell. And then it's still green and then you can move on to writing new tests so your code your tests will turn red again and then you're going to fix that this basic idea of as you want to write new functionality you stop take a deep breath and write a test first was elevated at some point of time to something now called test-driven development in which we have a whole minimal, in my opinion, process for software development that is quite beneficial to high quality software, predictable speed and so forth. So test-driven development is a small development process using test-first programming um, where you work off a sprint backlog or any stack of features to implement one after another and churn out the tests and the corresponding implementations. And this way you can grow your product, your software incrementally and steadily. So here's how it looks like. You have a feature as input, for example, something from a sprint backlog. 
uh, developer picks a feature and writes the first test. Now the test runners, the test frameworks will say will fail because there's no implementation even yet for the test. So it's red all the way. Now you implement it and you keep implementing things until that initial test becomes green, meaning you succeed, the tests succeed. But you only wrote a simple test. You did not fully implement the feature yet. So now you go back from adding functionality, um, go back, put on the testing hat again. Remember the two hats you might be wearing. wearing. And now you add an additional test. Uh, one more test, one more test that cover the feature, the whole perspective on the feature, what's needed, all the acceptance criteria. And once you added a new test, you go back to implementation, add new functionality that makes the test green. And now you go back to the testing again. So you go back and forth between these two hats or two study of work between writing a test and implementing functionality to make the test work. And until and when finally the test suites cover all the acceptance criteria and you believe the feature is done, then you exit this uh, back and forth between tests and implementing functionality and move on to the next feature. Moving on to the next feature means simply to pick the next feature of the stack, maybe for take it out of the sprint backlog and go through the same uh, iterative loop of writing tests to cover the acceptance criteria of a feature and an entity definition of done and then writing code to fulfill the tests and iterate over that until you've covered the whole feature after which you put the feature onto the done stack or in review if you have a scrum process around it and move on to the next feature. So that's was test-driven development. So in this uh, second section, final section of part five on software development, we covered the basic principles of agile programming as they have been given to us mostly through extreme programming. We looked at technical debt and refactoring as ways of thinking about code quality and calls to action to improve your code. And we looked at test first and test-driven development as a minimal software development process to get the work done. That's it for me. Thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next class.